This is Johnny Blue Star. Welcome to Threshold, a global media event. Is the universe just a random dance of atoms, or is it a manifestation of a supremely intelligent architect? Can its purpose, or our purpose here on Earth, be adequately assessed? Can we commune with it, know its intentions, cooperate with its direction? Here, we define threshold as a gateway state of awareness, allowing mankind to cross into a place of real cognition. Threshold allows us to approach questions of higher reality through the door of experience rather than mere belief. Welcome to Threshold, where we tear away the veil from commercial media, bringing our audience and participants into another realm of reality and enhanced communication. Welcome back to Threshold. The mission of this program has always been that the closer mankind gets to the core of his existence, which is a sacred connection to the divine presence, the closer he will become to the meaning of his existence and to the possibility of a just, sane, and prosperous society. It has been my observation that throughout history, there have always been men and women who have reached some level of this alignment with divinity, but there have also been people who have co-opted their message and their teaching for the sake of obtaining social and personal power over other people. That is why the various world scriptures often contain passages, thoughts, and assertions that seem to contradict the idea that contact with divinity produces a capacity for unconditional love, forgiveness, and guidance within. Although I believe the true message does allow for self-defense and for self-empowerment and enrichment, it is a path that moves forward without lust for power over others, enrichment at the expense of others, and the use of aggressive force to obtain one's objective. When we hear the teachings of the Inquisition that claims that certain people or teachings are somehow the exclusive carrier of God's favor, when brutal aggression is carried out against specific groups on the basis of this favor, we can suspect that somehow that a true spiritual teaching has been sabotaged. In my own spiritual search, I have always felt that among those teachings that seem to hold certain keys to an enlightenment about one's relationship to the divine presence, masonry seemed to be a real candidate. To me, its symbols and rituals from an outsider's standpoint seem to convey something of a process of gradual enlightenment in conformity with the kind of teaching of spiritual alchemy or transformation conveyed in all the religions of the world and often disguised in a letter or number code. Yet in regards to this teaching, it is apparent that many commentaries today will claim the opposite about masonry, that its codes and symbols disguise an allegiance with darker powers, and even that it, even, and even that it is a component of the grand scheme to control human population on this planet. This claim is so abundant on the internet in particular that I believe it is valuable and necessary to bring an opposing point of view, one by a person I, one by a person I know as an individual, as a patient, and a guest on my show, Dr. Hugo Rodier, MD, who from very early in his career as a physician focused on nutrition as the key foundations of good health and was always willing to put the truths about healing before the medical doctrines he encountered that ignored nutrition's role in health. Now much of medical science is catching up with his understanding of nutrition. In this show, Dr. Rodier is a committed mason and a student of positive metaphysics who will help pull us off, will help us to pull off the veil to some extent to expose the essence of Masonic philosophy and practice. Welcome to Threshold, Dr. Rodier. So thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. And it's a pleasure to be, have this opportunity to talk to you again. Why don't you start by telling us first how, how you came across Masonry in whatever way you did, and, and why did you become actually involved? Well, first of all, Johnny, I, I loved your intro. I hope I can live up to all that. <laughs> but it's very true. Uh, masonry is a bit controversial, and I'm glad to have uh, a few minutes of your time to... Uh, give an opposing, a contrasting point of view to all that. Thank you. Um, basically, I've been interested in masonry f uh, since I was 14 years old. Um, it's no secret that I wanted to become a priest at that point, but uh, Mormonism came about and derailed those plans. I think it was a good thing at the time. As a young man, I needed some structured guidance. Uh, and so I caught wind of Joseph Smith being a Mason, and it was very intriguing to me because it wasn't brought up much in the Mormon Church. 
Um, then in my mid thirties, as I grew older and had studied just about every philosophy in the in the world, I began to see that I needed to move on. So I began to explore masonry, since I already had a, that connection. Uh, fortunately, I wound up uh, picking up the right books. Uh, back then, no internet. Uh, that might have helped. Um, right. In, in my quest for studying masonry. Then it was very frustrating because, as you know, masonry is by invitation only. And uh, not that many masons in Utah, where I ended up living after my medical training. So it's very frustrating to drive past the huge Masonic temple just uh, down the block from the big Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. And uh, one time, I going through the internet, I found that uh, they had uh, Masons had uh, meetups, or a bunch of Masons would go to a cafe and welcome any non-Mason to hang out to learn about Masonry, and that's how I got plugged in. Not to my amazement, I was able to see that all the searching I'd done throughout my whole life, because I've been a searcher, a seeker, uh, was masonry. I just didn't know what to call it, and that was the most uh, attract, uh, attracting point for me, the metaphysics, the esoterica of masonry, uh, which um, unfortunately has been kept um, a bit too secretive to my taste. But it's a generational thing, you know, after the war, the big war, mm -hmm. it became very secretive for many reasons, but that's changing. Uh, like I said, uh, we, we have meetups now for uh, interested people to come and check out masonry. So things are changing, uh, and so that's why I'm able to get on the radio with you and, and talk about masonry openly. Well, basically, uh, a lot of uh, Masonic architecture and symbolism in Mormonism is similar, isn't it? Uh, since Joseph Smith and his brother and other people in his family were connected with masonry. Yes, his father, his father and uh, Hiram, his brother, were very active. Joseph joined uh, as well, but he had other fish to fry, as you know, so he wasn't as active as the males in his family. Now, Mormons will tell you that Joseph came to all the symbols and all the ceremonies and all that through his own revelations directly from God. And that's fine. You know, we, half of Masons in Utah are Mormons, so we respect that point of view. Um, but uh, other opinions will tell you that Joseph did learn a lot from the Masons. It becomes a matter of faith. If, if you believe that Joseph saw God and God told him all these things, then how can you argue with that? I don't want to. I don't feel the need for. I totally respect my Mormon brothers, if you will. So I don't see a need to hash it out and discuss whether Joseph saw God or not. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, of course. I understand that. I live in Utah, too. Okay. And uh, I respect the, the Mormon faith. But I do think there are things that you can say uh, that, are, that are quite interesting about... Um, about the connection between Joseph Smith and, and uh, you know, and, and Masonry. Yes, the, for those who want to really delve into this, it's, it's a very rich history. Uh, two years ago, a Utah, University of Utah professor published a terrific book, uh, Joseph's Temples. I highly recommend it for those interested people because this professor, I forget his name, does a tremendous job, very impartial. Uh, both Masons and Mormons are very happy with that book. And that would be a, an in-depth study of the whole issue if anyone is interested. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's a quote about that connection. It's, um, it's from a book called Refiner's Art, The Making of Mormon Cosmology. It says, Freemasonry provides a point of entry into this very complex story. As it has been in Vermont, Masonic fraternity was a dominant feature of the cultural landscape in Joseph Smith's Ontario County. The dense network of lodges and chapters help explain the Masonic symbolism that runs through the story of the discovery of the Golden Plates. 
Most obviously, the story of the discovery in a stone vault on a, temp- a hilltop echoed the Enoch myth of royal arch masonry, in which the prophet Enoch, instructed by a vision, preserved the Masonic mysteries by carving them on a golden plate that he placed in an arched stone vault marked with pillars to be rediscovered by Solomon in the years to come. So um, there, is, there is a definite interesting connection in the sort of life of Joseph Smith and the life of Enoch. That doesn't mean that, that doesn't uh, obliterate the uh, possibility of direct revelation, but it is interesting. And the last words, I believe, of Joseph Smith were a, a, a cry for help, which is the Masonic call for help. Isn't that true? <laughs> It is very true. I read that book. I think it's a good book, um, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. The whole thing about the golden plates, as you know, uh, there's so much more uh, that connects the two um, philosophies, if you will. There was a little bit of bad blood uh, after Joseph's de- death, but that has been patched up as of 1984. Uh, the two organizations are in very good terms. As, as, as I said, uh, half of Masons in Utah are Mormons. So the hatch is buried and we kissed and made up and it's all good in Utah. Well, that's good to hear. Well, now another thing that we're discussing, which is really much more known to the public than, uh, than connections between Mormonism and Masonry, is uh, some rather unsavory claims <laughs> yeah. and these these claims are so sometimes so outrageous they oh, yeah. they're they're funny you know they're they're sort exactly. of funny but i exactly. want to ma- mention the sure. what i consider to be the main one yes and the main one is the claim that 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 masonry the kind of masonry you're involved with uh-huh. is there to create a, a new world order and you and know. also that, that the higher degrees are basically for the purpose of wedding those members to a satanic cult in league with Lucifer and the powers of darkness. Now, I know that myself that this is not, not, has nothing to do with uh, your type of masonry. There may be other types of masonry that have sort of cannibalized some of the symbols and such and, uh, and, and are quite negative. But what is this to the story of some kind of Masonic group trying to create a new world order today? Well, let's start with that one. Uh, the other one we'll tackle in a minute, I hope. Um, the whole um, story about the Illuminati and all that has its grains of truth. Um, and uh, it goes back to Germany uh, when a bunch of uh, philosophers uh, felt that they were much better than everybody else and they should uh, be on top teaching people how to live, how to run their lives. But that's nothing new, Johnny. You know that that's uh, it happens in history over and over again. And they these people um, in Germany infiltrated Masonic lodges because it was the only outlet for free thinking. You know, think about it. Uh, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and all that, if you so much said anything to contradict the world view uh, monopolized by the Catholic Church off with your head or you were put on the stretcher and got taller real quick right uh, if not roasted in the in a fire pit like uh, de Molay in France yes uh, etc so lodges of masons true operative masons who work with stone and all that building cathedrals since they had more education and they had the ear of popes and kings sure they wanted cathedrals and castles, began to organize to keep their uh, building secrets and at the same time they organized themselves under morality rules because without morality, without equality, how are you going to keep all those secrets uh, of building together and get along? So lodges uh, began to organize for many reasons, even for trade if you will. Pretty soon these men began to philosophize and adopt esoterica and mysticism from way back which is always lie dormant it's just part of man part of our nature so given the impetus and the seeds planted of democracy in these lodges it began to attract people uh, 
that were disenfranchised out there. The Illuminati type of people, they could not meet. They would also uh, be uh, sacrificed at the stake, if you will. And so they began to infiltrate Masonic lodges. It happens all the time. Okay, think about it. Uh, if you have a group of men that are willing to shelter you and call you brother, and, and you got some radical views that uh, uh, require some cocooning, you kind of gravitate to these lodges. There's no other game in town, or you lose your head. Does that make sense? Yes, and I would think so, particularly uh, in, in Germany of that era, which was the 18th century. Exactly. Uh, you're, you're talking about Adam Weiss Haupt's organization yes. called the Illuminati, which will right. we'll get into a little bit more in a moment. Right, right. now, we have to take a break. Okay. And, uh, Over the years, I have worked as a lyricist with master composer Edgar Ahrens. Many of our songs were specifically developed with Patricia Welch, a singer with an unusual capacity for diversity in her musical genres, but also with an uncanny grasp of the hidden beauty that a musical score and a set of lyrics can never match without the sensitive alignment with a great performer. Here's one of our songs, essentially a romantic song, that could easily be talking about a quest for a divine connection. It is called My Heart is Ready. is a coming-of-age novel by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. It is about a young Tom Boots Raymond who grows up in New York in the 1940s who was a member of a street gang. My friends and I were about to start our own game of stickball when Rabbit Lacey, the head of the Rattlers, came up to us and tried to move in on our game. We were called dwarves, the youngest members of the stupid gang. Hey, Kevin, I need you to get some gloves and some stuff I left at my place. No, this is our game. Hey, are you my good little dwarf or what? You've been calling me a dwarf since I was six. We're not your personal slaves, pal. Hey, what is this? A dwarf rebellion? All right, big guy. We ditched the dwarf thing. We make you guys regular rattlers. No, it's too late. He looked at Jay and me. We looked away. Rabbit was now angry and he pushed Kevin hard with the palms of his hands. Kevin tried to ram him in the stomach, but he stepped aside, throwing Kevin into the curb where he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely at the knee. Still, he managed to get up. My street. Kevin shouted at Rabbit, pointing at him with an angry index finger. Find out more by Googling Boots in Manhattan, a 1940s coming-of-age novel, part one of the novel series The Foot Soldier by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. That's Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. 
My company, New Galaxy Enterprises, is a California corporation specializing in the creation of media and promotional content. We are focused on original, innovative projects that are good for humanity. These projects could be nonfiction books or novels, fictional screenplays or documentary content, websites and website content, commercial advertising content for print, audio or video products on the internet, television or radio, musical scores for advertising, television or film, video, audio editing, etc. We want to promote products and projects that support the environment, encourage a healthy experience in living, developing, nurturing and useful technology and offering platforms for positive, socially constructive entertainment or informative, transformative media. Our experience in creating a variety of products like this is rather vast and we offer client-based and collaborative products, as well as the opportunity of active investors to join us in the creation and promotion of proprietary products, some of which are in latter stages of development. For more information, go to www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. That's www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. If you're interested in talking to us, just fill out the contact sheet and we will get back with you. Hi, we're back on Threshold with Dr. Hugo Rodier discussing the sort of essence of masonry, and we've been contrasting it to people like those in the uh, 18th century uh, in an organization called the Illuminati that was founded by Adam Weishaupt that basically infiltrated different lodges and allowed a sort of development of an organization that bared a certain relationship to masonry, but really had quite opposite principles. Is that correct, doctor? Yes. Now, specifically, after setting the background for the real answer, is that um, the Illuminati type of guys uh, having invaded the Masonic lodges in in, uh, Germany began to make a lot of noise that became embarrassing to the regular Masons who didn't have that agenda and were kicked out. Uh, Masonic lodges disenfranchised or, if you will, suspended the rights of those so-called Masons, so they were thrown out, in other words. The same thing happened in France. You know, people love to quote Robespierre and all those uh, reign of terror type of uh, revolutionaries uh, who made a big mess of France at the time. People love to say they were Masons. Yes, it's true, but the same thing happened in France. Once they made a lot of noise, the Masonic lodges kicked them out. Think about it. The main, one of the main tenets of Masonry is brotherly love, uh, equality, and all those things. And Illuminati type of people, uh, revolutionaries that are willing to chop off everybody's heads, that's the last thing they have in their minds, morality, equality. And so, no, it runs totally opposite to Masonic basic principles of democracy. Further, if it were true that at the upper echelons of Masonry there were secret or uh, sub-organizations, if you will, that still harbor these take over the world type of things, uh, it would have come out by now. Uh, it's just amazing how common sense does not prevail when people entertain these far out ideas. Yeah, you know, I, I'm thinking now of Christianity in its earlier stages. I mean, could you have, if, if there was any kind of goodness or truth in the teachings of Jesus, would it have would those be the people who who use Christianity as a foil for, the, say, the Crusades or uh, even, even as bad the uh, Inquisition? So you have a lot of takeovers, I think, in in all types of organizations that have a spiritual basis. Absolutely. A- another, you know, I might as well bring it up because. Uh, I'm sure somebody's thinking about it. It's uh, uh, the Golden Dawn with this, uh, what's his name? Uh, Alistair Crowley, you mean? Yes. Was he a Mason? Yes. But he was kicked out. I mean, the guy became quite radicalized with his far out ideas. And so, look, just save yourself a time. Just about every organization, and I mean just about every organization, has had its roots in Masonry. Why? Because it was the only shelter from the big mother church. You see, I mean, it it just, to me, to my mind, and it's very analytical, as you know. I've read a lot about these things. uh, It just resonates with me, what I just told you. Yeah. Well, 
when I was, I remember a, a story, W.B. Yeats, the famous poet and one of the greatest poets, I think, in the English language in the modern times. He was uh, in the, uh, he was the head of the lodge in London, I believe, of the Golden Dawn. And when he heard that Alistair Crawley was going to come over to the lodge, he started to burn things. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Alistair Crawley truly would be an example of somebody who turned things like that quite upside down and yes. uh, mix, uh, mixing sex and heroin with his, uh, his rituals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so if anybody, anybody thinking we still do those things in our uh, sacred meetings, no, absolutely not. Well, let's, let's get to another part of this uh, so we can just dispense with it which is the, the claim that somehow masonry is behind the, a new world order. Now, this, this, there are many different theories about a new world order. The Illuminati is a famous one, and the connection with masonry is a negative side to it. You know, it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that there is a secret cabal. Uh, I think most Americans do believe that now. Mm -hmm. But you know what, Johnny? Is it a secret anymore that there is such a cabal? I mean, just reading the paper, everything that's going on screams at us that there's a shadow government. So Yes, I, I agree with that about this shadow government. The, the right. thing is, people do take it to extraordinary lengths, including people like D David Icke, who are basically are saying that there, that there are certain royal families that have a blood type that has, <clears throat> is, re is related to their being... <laughs> <laughs> Reptili yeah. reptilian uh, right. creatures from other dimensions who have somehow yeah. bl I mean I even heard that George that George W had a skin graft because his skin was starting to scale like a reptilian. Yeah. I have trouble with those yeah. that extent but, of that that cabal but that there is a group that is trying to basically create a, some type of a a world order that is not beneficial to us. I think it's quite possible. Yes, and in my way of thinking, it's out in the open. I mean, if you just look at the economics of our nations, it's all about bankers and who control the money. Uh, John Adams famously said, there is no freedom unless you understand how money works. Uh -huh. The average American doesn't know all the hanky-panky going on with fiat money and all that. Yes. So having said that, are there some guys who are masons in that cabal? Yes. Are there some guys that are Catholic in that cabal? Yes. Are there some Mormons that are part of that cabal? Yes. In other words, human nature being what it is, each one of those guys at the top, whatever you want to call it, will have some preferences about their, their philosophies and whatever floats their boat. So for me to say there are no Masons in it, it doesn't make sense, as it does not make sense to say that they're all Masons. Well, I think that... Uh Basically, we're definitely in agreement about these things. It's unfortunate that the Internet has two sides to it. One is a powerful way of liberating people through knowledge. And another way is a powerful way of deceiving people through disinformation. Yes. And, and through self-disinformation, self too, with people who have basically, without thinking, have become followers of different points of view. Well, let me say one more thing about this. It is... Totally documented, the main tenet of masonry is equality, morality, brotherly love. And all the things we've been talking are far, far divorced from those basic Masonic tenets. Well, I'll tell you, you have a, a, an interesting person who agrees with you. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Illuminati was in Bavaria was founded in 1776. And this is probably, you know, one of the main groups that perverted the Masonic doctrines and whose message leaked out to the masses. The order that, that was known uh, as the Illuminati grew to prominence during George Washington's career. And as you know, George Washington was a very prominent Masonry. And I, I have a very interesting little statement about him through a book uh, by Robert Hieronymus, and he quotes in it an 1848 manuscript. He says, when, when Washington was confronted with the story of these, uh, of these uh, Illuminati penetrating the United States, he said he, he condemned them as self-created societies and dealt them a blow that 
led to their disappearance. Disappearance. When questioned about whether or not Illuminism had spread to Masonry in America, Washington answered that, quote, he did not believe that the lodges of Freemason in this country had his societies endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenet of the former Illuminati or the pernicious principles of the latter, uh, Jacobinism. So well, George Washington you. agrees with you. <laughs> and we'll get a little bit more into, uh, in, into George Washington uh, later on. I hope so. But I think right now, let's, let's uh, focus now that we've discussed what masonry is not. Perhaps we could try and discuss what it truly is. Where, where, what actually is it, and where did it originate? Well, uh, Johnny, if you don't mind, there was a two-part. Your question was uh, two parts. Oh, okay. Go ahead. The other part was, do we worship Satan? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, let me tell you. He is the life of the party. When we go to lodges, he's always... Staring things up, life of the party. Yeah, that guy, old scratch. I tell you, Johnny, <laughs> we laugh over these things. The whole thing about Masons worshiping Lucifer has been well documented by the most even-minded people that it was a hoax by a Frenchman, Toxol. It was debunked a few months after this idiot put out all these things out there, and yet, even though it's been debunked and put to rest, it comes up over and over and over again, misquoting Albert Pike and many other well-known Masons. So I can tell you, it is absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, we have fun with it. I, it the same with the Illuminati thing. I, we laugh. It, it's, it's a great joke among us. Now, I heard the story that really intrigues me which is that the Knights Templar, who we've mentioned briefly before, uh -huh. um, were, of course, you were, you were talking about de Molay. You were talking about the time that the, the French king basically decided to destroy the Knights Templars. Maybe you could go into a little bit about that background and tell us if there is any connection between the, the end of the Knights Templars and the formation of the, of the Masons. Sure, 1307, Friday the 13th, Philip Le Beau. Philip Lebeau, um, uh, French king in ruins, and a king who had Gregory V imprisoned at Bordeaux, the pope, the second pope, it's called the Bordeaux imprisonment, where this Philip Lebeau practically kidnapped and created his own pope in Bordeaux to follow his own rules, um, began to lust after the money and the power of the Templars. And so the church and the state, if you will, uh, concocted stories uh, saying that the Templars were uh, satanic worshipers, that they were doing all kinds of terrible things. Listen, money was involved, okay? The minute you inject money in a conversation and a group of people is robbed of their money and it all goes to the church and the state, you have to question a whole lot of things about those stories. Now, were the Templars prototypes prototypes of modern Mormons? Yes and no. There are two schools of thought in Masonry, the Authentics and the Romantics. The Authentics claim that modern Masonry began in 1717 when it was formally organized in London, putting a few existing lodges together. The Romantics say, no, it's been around since Adam, if you will, and uh, it just goes into hiding, if you will, and it comes back in another form another reincarnation, then it goes back under what? Persecution. So did the Templars en entertain some basic ideas of the perennial philosophy, that philosophy that is very, very basic? I'm sure they did, as many other groups have had in the past. Did Is there a connection between the Templars and the modern Masons unbroken? No. I'm a romantic. I, I say, as you imply in your intro, that God speaks to men's souls in the quietness of our hearts with the same truth, whether we live in Argentina or China in the Middle Ages or today or with Adam, it is all the same. Why should it be different? So whether the Templars uh, did this handshake or that salute or not, whether they had the same symbols as we did or not, I can assure you that Masonry strives 
to get the very basic symbolism of very basic truths. So as such, I believe there are connections to all those august groups of antiquity that have entertained more esoteric ideas that only a few understand because only a few have pure hearts. Well, I, w I guess the story I'm relating about Knights Templars was that, th that there was an actual transmission to certain people uh, while they were imprisoned uh, so that the teachings could go on. And of course, they couldn't, they, they didn't want to express themselves as the Knights Templars anymore, but they, uh -huh. they needed a different uh, sort of cover identity. Yes, uh, there's many, many connections to uh, the Knights of St. John, uh, the Hospitaliers, and there are many right. other organizations that uh, are said to have been Templars who just uh, changed their names. Right. Yeah, and, and some of them will tell you, oh, they came to um, America, they went to Scotland, they went to Portugal, they went to Spain, Madagascar. Yeah, it's probably true. I mean, these people scattered like rats from a sinking ship. I mean, what are you going to do? And so I'm sure there are remnants of uh, Templar remnants throughout uh, the world, if we care to look deep enough. But, you know, Johnny, the point I was making is that somebody on top of a mountain, totally isolated, if he or she truly seeks, will get the same ideas the same connection with uh, that big consciousness that uh, many call God, and no matter what background, what uh, situation, because such is the nature of humankind. I, I believe we're totally connected to divinity. So uh, the the symbols, as good as they are, are sort of uh, a representation of deeper truths that are available to all mankind, whether they're Masons or not. I, I completely agree with that, and I, I think it's important to realize that we don't have to know the exact his, historicity of these right. various religious traditions, or, or try to find and you know look for them and and think that finding them is going to be a, a real critical element to our salvation. No, it's listening and becoming and being able to commune with that presence. We're going to go for a break now, and we'll be right back with more on the true nature of masonry with Dr. Hugo Rodier. Edgar Aaron's a Russian composer, and I have worked together for years. Very happy that Edgar has allowed my company, New Galaxy Enterprises, to be a contact point for his work. Let's hear a little about him. I've worked with Russian composer Edgar Aaron for quite a few years, building an inventory of songs, many of which feature singer-performer Patricia Welch. We will soon be releasing these songs, components of an album and a musical in progress called Hadley's Castle. When Edgar and I first got together, I was amazed by the brilliance of his musical scores created for movies, TVs, and animations. Here is a sample of the work he did on the Russian TV series, available now on Amazon, called The Secret Agent's Memoir, which had two seasons. This score is called Escape and was created for the first season. I am very pleased to say that Bridge of Light Productions, a division of New Galaxy Enterprises, is proud to be the contact point for television and film companies seeking information about this amazing composer's work. If you're in the entertainment business and wish to know more, contact me at johnnybluestar at gmail.com. That's johnnybluestar at gmail.com. It is the 15th century. El Tesoro de Cielo, a Spanish treasure ship, sends a scouting expedition to a strange island. Golden statues surrounding them prove the enormity of their find. Suddenly, hordes of ghoulish creatures with scaly green flesh and skeletal wings descend upon them from the sky. What do you think of this, Rufio? These creatures are fragile, Captain. We can take them with our swords. 
They seem supernatural. Who knows what powers they possess? Fallen angels weakened by their treason. My God, are you saying they're Nephilim, the devil's host? I'm saying whatever they are, we can take them. Do any of you cowards dare join me? Up against sharp knife-like nails and hideous fangs, the men's swords rip into slimy green flesh. Though black blood pours copiously from their half-naked bodies, creatures miraculously persist. Can the crew survive this bloody, cursed battle? Find out more by googling The Thrice Born, a new sci-fi supernatural novel by Carlos Lopez Avery and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Carlos Johnny Kendall, The Thrice Born. That's Carlos Johnny Kendall, The Thrice Born. New Galaxy Enterprises is a media company specializing in wide-ranging content like novels, non-fiction books, screenplays, commercial advertising, web content, etc. One of our most esteemed providers is illustrator Robert W. Zalo. I work on all my most important projects like book covers, logos, web design elements with Robert. As an illustrator, he worked on the Ignatz-nominated comic book, The Expert's Guide to Killing Things That Go Bump in the Night. His skills encompass advertising, magazine illustrations, gaming, comic books, TV production, and scenic painting. His clients include Comcast, Adelphia, Haven Talent, Forceworks, High Octane Theater, Star Creative Advertising. If you wish to contact Robert, go to johnnybluestar.com and let me know. That's johnnybluestar.com. For artist, illustrator Robert Zalo, an essential component of all the work we do. Maybe he can help you too. This is Johnny Blue Star back with Dr. Hugo Rodier talking about the essence of masonry. <clears throat> We've already talked about some of the uh, difficulties in understanding what masonry really is and some of the distortions. And we've also talked about some of the possible legacies of masonry, but also the importance that masonry believes that there is a possibility of communing with God through one's own consciousness. And because of that, uh, the, the reality of the tradition of masonry isn't as important as its living presence. Is that correct, Doctor? Absolutely. Well, tell, tell us something about the, the principal tenets of masonry. What, what, sure. what, are, what are its sort of intellectual foundations, spiritual foundations? We like to think that it's a perennial philosophy, meaning very basic concepts that people have known since the foundation of the world. Um, and before a, a mason is initiated, he, he hears a little lecture, and it's no secret, it's on the internet, and it begins kind of like this. Masonry is far removed from everything that is trivial, selfish, and ungodly. It is a beautiful system of morals, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Its principal tenets are brotherly love, relief, and truth. It is uh, un founded upon an unbiased foundation of an unfaint belief in the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of men, and the immortality of the soul, quote-unquote. That's very interesting, yes. It's loaded with meaning. So we, after a man becomes a mason, we dissect that to the nth degree. Of course, most of it is done by the mason himself. We don't like to spoon-feed people, and we'll get into that in a minute. Okay. Well, so go that's ahead. a very basic definition of masonry. Yet there's a lot more we, which we can unwrap. Well, so would you, what would you say are, are, is the most important core concept of masonry within those tenets you mentioned? It all boils down to uh, the Greek saying that we find on, on uh, what's this place in Greece, on card on top of the temple, Know thyself. To know, and, know thy seotan. Right, to know thyself and to know God. And in and, and, and masonry, we, we symbolize that with our, uh, all the noise we make about the lost word, which basically is a way of saying mankind has a hard time understanding who we truly are, who God truly is, and our relationship with him, her, or it. And so everything that uh, we talk about is geared to that understanding. We call it traveling east. 
And it's when we find out who we are, who God is, there's just no way for any immorality, any desire to hurt people in your heart anymore. Your heart is filled with a, a, a need to love others, to understand others, to be charitable, to be respectful, because we see divinity in us and our fellow man. And, and this is more than just an intellectual understanding. Oh, absolutely. This is an experience of right. a certain level of consciousness. Exactly. And so, you know, we don't tell, we don't openly discuss these things, even in, even in lodges. And I'll tell you why. Because each man is at a different level. You see, we have uh, Jewish people, we have Islam, we have Sufis, we have Baptists, Catholics, Mormons, Unitarians, Buddhists, uh, Hindus, and Masonry. So, if we begin to spell out what, say, I perceive to be this consciousness, the guy who next to me who feels that God is a white guy with a beard floating on some cloud, it's just not going to be comfortable with what I just said. And, and you know what? I respect my brothers who have that idea of divinity. Hey, if it floats your boat, if that's how you interpret the symbols, more power to you. The bottom line is how we end up treating each other, fellowship. Well, I think that um, there is a progression. And it, there is a, it is important to provide people with some of these ideas so that they can connect to the rest of them. And ultimately, they're going to have to connect on their own. Exactly. You know, um, we would like to spell out all these things a lot more in Lodge. So we end up talking very little about particular dogmas, even political parties, because it's the nature of most men to get offended if somebody has a different opinion. So this is how masonry has become so democratic, is by dealing with symbols. Take, for instance, uh, a very dear symbol that we have, Hiram Abiff. Uh -huh. Of course, he gets killed, and then he's resurrected and all that business. Now, any Catholic or any Christian out there will immediately say, oh, that's a symbol for Jesus Christ. You know what? You're right. But so is the guy sitting across the room from you who feels that's a symbol of Osiris, or a symbol of Thor, or a symbol of Buddha, etc., etc. So imagine if any one of us was to get up and say, hey, you know, this is the way you need to interpret Hiram Abiff. No, we don't do that. So we talk in common denominators, which at once is a strength in masonry and a weakness, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I like to tell people about this, Johnny, is really simple. Because we are mostly Christians, we're mostly Bible type of people, right? Now, recall what Jesus did at the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, he gathered the masses and talked about very basic principles of getting along, which are well known to all of us. Then, as the crowds dispersed, he said to the apostles, uh, Come with me, I will teach you the secrets. And so... As much as it might sound preposterous or self-serving, we believe that the symbols we have speak of those mysteries that are only given to those who seek, truly seek. They don't need to be Masons. They don't need to be Catholics. They can just be sitting, be sitting on top of a mountain all by themselves and get it. And so how do you teach those things that most people are not ready to receive? And so we do it with symbols. Yeah, well, I understand that. I, I know because I've gone through a lot of different spiritual practices, and the ones that perhaps are the most important to me are ones that are, would be very difficult to convey to other people. But they are similar to what I conceive to be a lot of symbolic sim symbolism in masonry. Oh, absolutely, because you know, masonry... You know, when I said that just about every philosophy has come out of masonry, I didn't mean to say the modern organized masonry, 1717. I spoke of that perennial philosophy. Uh, Huxley 
has a beautiful book about this perennial philosophy, which I highly recommend it. There's not one word about masonry in it. Huxley goes for those uh, very ancient symbols and concepts that, again, we call perennial philosophy and develops that idea very well. Well, I would like to think on a personal level that masonry symbolizes the perennial philosophy and from it all philosophies and religious have, religions have sprung. Do you think in the higher orders there's more of a, of a specific understanding conveyed or uh, sort of the, the idea, the practicum behind the theory? Or, or is it basically uh, left out? Uh, great question. You know, Johnny, I'll answer that, but let me take off my Masonic hat and okay. just speak as Hugo Rodier. Okay. I believe that the whole universe, everything in it, is a manifestation of the mind of God or consciousness. You and I, Johnny, are part of it. Our egos are so strong because we need them to get from point A to B and to eat food and go to work that we forget this basic perennial idea. And so once we become aware of who we are, what God is, and to me it's all one ball of wax, one gigantic consciousness, if you will, there is no need to know anything because you are it. So all concepts are gone. It's what the thou talks about. It's the very concept of the thou. The thou needs no words. Because when you get to this basic understanding, all concepts, all principles, all dogmas, all ideas are gone. You just exist one thing, one thing only. Unity, the unity of consciousness. So why would we need concepts when there's just one thing? Does that make sense? It makes sense, yes. So that's my take on it. Now, now I believe I find those ideas and Masonic symbols. But Joe Blow across the street who believes in Joseph Smith will not agree with me. And yet he's a Mason. We're both Masons in good standing and we get along. I do think that some of the teachings that I'm aware of, what I would call teachings of spiritual alchemy, have to do with the restructuring of the human personality to more or less conform to divine essence. In other words, yes. breaking down, even though one has an awareness of a higher consciousness, doesn't mean that the false ego isn't still largely dominating one's consciousness and one's personality. So I, well, do, I do think there may be some aspects of, uh, of Masonic symbolism, or at least the symbolism I'm aware of, in which, um, in which there is a, uh, a teaching to help break down this uh, very recalcitrant aspect of ourselves. Well, you know, Johnny, I believe you just said the same thing. Um, in the second degree of Masonry, we talk about learning these ideas degree by degree, step by step. And so... I was talking about the ultimate outcome, but to getting there, yes, we need to uh, come to terms with these ego idea, which in my opinion cannot be fought. It's there to get you to point A, from point A to point B, and to feed you and to work and all those things. Just like having an arm. We can't say, I don't need this arm anymore. We need the ego um, because we're in a terrestrial material world where that's how we get from a point a to b uh, and and i believe you're right that uh, as we begin to see that that Ill, that's all the ego is and begin to look into our true identity and that happens to people immediately instantaneously uh, i can tell you i'm not one of those i'm just fighting the battle traveling east like the rest of mankind uh step by step so i yes but that's why we have our symbols and, and we hang out and we study and all that. It's a gradual process. I was talking of the ultimate outcome. Yes. Okay. Well, well, we'll return to this part of the conversation in just a few moments. But I think another thing we're going to do is touch on the, uh, our friend George Washington again and how that might, masonry might have worked at the beginning of uh, our republic. 